So hello everyone and welcome to our gig community call as part of our AI series. This is the second call actually on the series. The last one was uh, a great session hosted by Geraldine and we had Dan Kingori with us talking about generated images uh, through AI. Probably the most, it's a, it's the level where a lot of users uh, interact with AI, the outputs of AI, this technology. Uh, we have gone into how to spot AI generated images, what it means for security, what it means for safety, and how could we use uh, better ways to fact check um, for that period of time. Uh, today, we're happy to be going one level deeper, talking and understanding better the technology that goes behind this, um, uh, mainly the neural networks uh, that are responsible for such outputs and how they operate. What do we need to know about the technology today? This is going to uh, happen through the session. We'll try to get more hands-on, understanding the T in, in GPT or chat GPT, transformer network, allegedly uh, one of uh, the most significant inventions, technological inventions in, in um, um, the 21st century. Uh, some would go even to say that it's the closest to how a human brain functions. So I personally am very, very curious to learn more from Adriano, our uh, amazing member and speaker for today, um, on on this and just understand better how this technology functions, but also gets get getting hands-on uh, to the actual work. We're also very happy to have Eric with us as a co-host today, who's going to take us on a tour on other possibilities for uh GPT technologies, uh, some of which are open source. What does it mean to install an open source GPT uh, on your computer and how could that be beneficial in, in cases, um, uh, in different cases, but mostly for the work of gig members and for grassroots innovators around the world. With this, I will hand over to Adriano um, and I will just uh, be happy to welcome you and ask you to introduce yourself better and lead us into the session and later on with Eric as well. Great, thank, thank you, Fajr. Thank you everyone for attending this session. Uh, let me introduce myself while I share my screen and I will ask, I don't know who is hosting that, maybe to enable the screen sharing. But I, I'm a journalist and based in Brazil, and I've been working with data science and open source um, projects for a while, some several years now. And I'm particularly interested in the use that we can make from open source AI models, particularly for NGOs and media newsrooms and independent, independent organizations, right? So. The today's talk will be more kind of we, we have two parts. The first one is kind of more conceptual. I will try to make this short, but I'm feeling that I will fail. But I, I feel like like in some sense the, the conceptual part is very important to, to understand the potential and the limitations of the different tools that we can face now and in the future. But I, I really do want to, to, to have a hands-on moment and explore at least three different tools, open source tools that we can use to leverage the, the um, open source AI models for text, for audio, for, and for images. So that's our goal. We have less than a one, one hour. Let's hope for the best. Let's see if I can share my screen. Great. Now, yes, I can. So here we go. So as I said, I, I will try to, to make this first part, uh, the one here, the introduction and hugging face also very short to save us, let's say, at least 30 minutes to use three different tools, which will be actually pretty fast as well. But let's go. So this is the landscape that we have for AI today, like the mainstream landscape. We have large models with a high environmental cost, very expensive to train, 
very expensive to use. Sometimes some of them are free, but it doesn't mean that there are no costs. Um, they are proprietary. We don't know exactly which data uh, was used to train these models. And we don't know exactly the rules that apply to these models, the source code and et cetera. And they, they are general purpose solutions. They are one size fits all solution, which means that they are not tailored to specific uh, needs that you might have, or maybe your organization might have, or your local community might have, let's say different ways to express an idea or uh, specific words that are used only in a particular context with a particular meaning. Or even if we speak about non-English languages, the, the performance, um, I don't know how many of you have tried to use AI models for other language rather than English. And, but you probably notice that the, the, the performance uh, changed drastically, right? It's like when we are using our other language, the model underperforms um, more than when we use English. So they are one size fits all solution. They, they, the companies sell these models as, look, we have an AI assistant that will help you to code, to classify text, to summarize your uh, research, research articles, to write a grant proposal, and so on and so on. They, they, should, be, they, they should do everything. And that's what we want. Or, or like that is the open source landscape for AI models. So instead of large language models, we have small models. We have models with fewer parameters but they are open source and they are mainly task oriented. You, of course, you, and we will explore later, uh, we have a general purpose uh, open source AI assistants, but I feel that the, the most interesting part in this open source landscape are not the general purpose models, are task specific models. You, you have a task you need, let's say, to summarize a document or you need to classify a text or classify images and you find a model that just do it, that just does this particular task and even better maybe in your language, not in English. So let we, when we explore um, hugging face, it will be possible to kind of see this variety of models. Um, but I wanted to start with kind of some, some concepts that are important to understand, mostly text-based models, but actually pretty much all um, deep neural networks, all generative AI models, all the current um, main AI models are grounded on this, on this idea and use this um, this concept and this con concept is embeddings. I don't know how many of you have heard about embeddings before. Uh, just to make sure that I'm not kind of explaining something too basic. Uh, can if you, you can just paste can you maybe explain chat, it uh, very briefly? I will. Yeah, sure. So. I just wanted to have an idea like of the, the, the level to, to, to optimize the time. But I, I will start, let's start with the basics. So embeddings are basically a sequence of, of numbers, a really long sequence of numbers. And these numbers work as kind of semantic coordinates. So let, let's unpack this idea. So when you input text or when you input audio, non-video or video or any kind of non-structured non data, right? Text, video, audio. Um, what the first step is to convert this, um, this input in a sequence of numbers that the model can actually do. Uh, as, you, as you know, the computers can't understand like text, period, text, period, image. So the first step is to convert this input into a sequence of numbers 
that can be modeled, that can be uh, dealt by the, 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 the AI model, right? And the interesting thing about this numeric representation is that they work, as I said, as, a, as coordinates, but they, they are kind of semantic coordinates. So let's start with a very simple example in text uh, using only two dimensions, right? So let's see this picture at the, the right here. You have a dimension of age, you have a dimension of gender, and then you have like two different words representing these uh, concepts. And they, they, the position that they have in these coordinates are meaningful. They represent something. In that case, we are predefining the, the axis. We are predefining the, 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 what the x axis mean, what the y axis mean. But in, in reality, what happens is this kind of this, instead of predefining this axis, it's extracted from the data, from the patterns that the model will encounter with the data. So here is another example. You have the words mathematics, aesthetics, and they are kind of close together. And tiger and lion uh, is, are also close together. I guess we can very quickly do a very uh, short exercise here. I will. I can share all of these links with you. Let me share the presentation because here you will be able to find all of the links to the notebooks and that we use and the tools that we use later. So can you perhaps uh, open the sharing access on the presentation? Uh, oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, so let's try this very short exercise. Can you please just paste here in the chat uh, a city? It might be the city you are currently in. And uh, fruits. And uh, if you want, like uh, random words, any kind of random concepts. So Kyoto, Mango. I will, I will leave this other words here and just add a few more. Okay, should be enough. As I said, we don't have much time. But what this notebook does is basically, and I will explain to you. Uh, okay, I will explain to you later how to use these notebooks if you never use it. Um, but what we, this exercise basically tries to plot these coordinates of the embedding. So we are converting each of these words into the numeric representation, the embeddings, and we are plotting it in two dimensions. Or originally, the, the, the embeds we are using you, we are using here have hundreds of dimension, but of course it we, it's hard to, we can't visualize hundreds of dimensions in a plot. So we try to compress all these dimensions into just two, so it's easy to plot in a shot. So let's compare here two representations of the of of these words. And can you notice any pattern? Is there anything that um, catches your attention in the way that the, the, the embeddings represent the semantic uh, meaning of the, of the words? Yeah, mango and hacker are related. But for this, we, 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 are, we have here two different models. So the one that's is spacey, it doesn't use the transformer architecture. And the, the one at the right, Bitten Bow, uses the most recent transformer architecture. So we see that different models represent the same words in different ways. It's like for, for Bitten Bow and 
let's say, uh, as below noted, Hacker and Mongo are kind of close together. But for spacing, Mongo, you see, well, they, they are kind of kind of close together, but not, not as much as here. And Global Innovation Gathering and Community Call are also both close together in, in both shops. So we see that the models can extract semantic features uh, from the text, but how, how does it work? Um, let me share my screen again. So yeah, just wanted to say that actually the, the key uh, insight behind this way to model words is it's not something new. The, this idea is grounded on um, on a very uh, like a long-standing linguistic theory that that says that uh, the meaning of a word is characterized by the company that this word keeps. So you can basically define and understand the meaning of the word by analyzing the sur surrounding context of this word. So, for instance, tiger and lion might appear in similar contexts. Uh, more similar than, let's say, mathematics and lion. So this is a, the, uh, an idea from the 50s, but only in 2013, we had the first kind of operationalization of this linguistic theory into a computational uh, artifact, which was the word to, vec uh, word to vector. Uh, paper and tool that preceded the transformed architecture that um, was originally published in 2017, I guess. Both worked back in, um, in the transformer architecture used by ChatGPT. They were created by the um, by Google, and but th they were created by Google, but they they released. It the not only the code but also the paper explaining the, the methodology the theory so it's kind of open source currently and just wanted to say that we are representing here and we saw just two dimensions to represent the semantic uh, space let's call it this way but actually uh, when we use gpt3 for instance uh, gpt3 GPT-3 uses like 12,000 uh, coordinates to represent the meaning of a word. Actually, uh, to represent the meaning of a token. And the token can be a word, but can also be a part of the word. So we will not get like much technical here. Um, I just wanted to, to, to reinforce this point because it's really the basis for everything that goes after after what for instance one way to the, to reduce the so-called hallucinations in the models are to use some documents to kind of try to ground the model try try to ground the answer of the models in some documents so when you let's say upload a pdf a book or maybe the uh, a call, a grant call to chat GPT and start to make questions, or if you use GPT for all that Eric will show us, you have an option there to upload the document. When you upload the document, the first thing is to convert this document into embeddings. And then when you prompt the model, the model will try to check which document is closest to your prompt in this embedding space. So all the GPT answers, all the AI models are kind of navigating this multidimensional space and trying to see close, uh, how the inputs are related to, to let's say, documents in, in, in this case. So this approach of using documents to ground the AI model and reduce hallucination is usually called as RAG, like Retrieval Augmented Generation. And we can go back to this idea in a few minutes. So I want let's talk about now how to train these models. And again, it's just an overview. Um, but the first step 
well, and what we usually refer as the free training stage it's an unsupervised stage which means that you don't have labels you don't have a specific task to be accomplished that you just kind of expose the model to a lot of text to a lot of data from scrape scraped from the internet and the task that you are going to train the model here is to predict the next word in a sequence. So it's it's basically a fill the gap game. You have a bunch of text and you imagine you, you have a sliding block hiding part of this text and you move this block in all, 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 all the way in the text. And you every time you ask the model, please, make predictions about which words should fill this gap, which words should like complete this sentence. Like here, for instance, the, the, and then we have a mask, it's hidden, of Francis Paris, and then the model, well, it's capital. So this is the first step. This is the, when we kind of try, we, we compress a lot of information in this, in this stage, but the resulting product, the resulting model, isn't useful at all. It's just repetitive. It might actually reproduce. It's good to reproduce text that the model has been exposed to, but it's not good to actually assist you in anything. It's just a kind of, uh, it's just copying patterns that was absorbed in the data. Then you have the next step, which is, which is crucial, which is actually train the model in a particular task. We can say that with the, here, what we are trying to do is kind of tame this wild, wild beast with a lot of information compressed, and we are trying to tame it into a specific direction. And this direction could be, well, you are a helpful chatbot assistant, and you are going to, I don't know, answer questions for me. Or maybe you are a text classifier, and uh, I will give you some labels, and I will give you a text, and you should assign the, task, the tasks to specific labels. Or maybe summarizer. There are any, like infinite possibilities to, to, pre, to, to train the model, right? But still, the model can, if the data that you are using to, like, to, to run the model is very different from the data used to train the model, you might not get good results uh, even so. So let's talk about how to adapt this, this three different, actually two different ways to to, to adapt the models to your particular needs. So the most, the most common approach, let's say the one that most people use when they interact with ChatGPT, for instance, is the so-called zero shots approach, which means that the model doesn't have any kind of context, they, they should, the, the model should address the task using only the data uh, that has been that has been that it, it has been trained on, right? So the second approach is few shots. So in, in few shots approach, in your prompt, in your interaction with the model, you provide some examples of how the answer should look like. So let's say if I'm using ChatGPT to classify a text, um, I could, in addition to, to, to write, writing all, all the labels that I want to use, I could provide some examples of each label. Look, if you have this text, the, the, the label is this one. If you have the other text, the label is that another one. So you provide a few examples to the model and then you, but you are not actually changing the way that the model works. You, in technical um, language, we could say that we are not changing the model parameters. You are just using the model and compressing more context into the inputs, but you are not changing the model weights, the model parameters. 
And then we have fine tuning, which became incredibly easy to, to fine tune a model currently. Um, I mean, you still need to have some idea of like Python, maybe uh, some programming language, but with just a few line of codes, you can, if you have enough data, um, if you have, let's say hundreds or maybe thousands of example, uh, you can fine tune the model. And when we say fine tune the model, we are actually changing the model parameters. We are going into the model and changing, tuning the model to the particular data, to the particular needs that we, we are trying to address. Um, so here are some do and don'ts for generative AI models. So they might be good for like maybe writing assistance, coding assistance. They are great for coding. Uh, I mean, you probably can't fine tune an AI model just using ChatGPT, even if you never had any previous experience with programming, because they, they are really great for coding. Um, maybe they can they, they can be used to summarize non-critical texts, like tip text that, well, we, you it's not critical, but you just want to, to have a glimpse, a short version of a very long PDF, let's say. And they can also explain some common sense knowledge, like why, why I'm saying common sense here, mostly because the pre-training part, because common sense knowledge have been kind of uh, very, they mostly have, they probably have been kind of very well, they, they, they've been very well represented in the training data. Like there are a lot of repetitions explaining the lot of different ways to explain the same concept. So probably the model will perform not bad in explaining common sense knowledge, but you shouldn't use these models to carry on fact-based research when you need to, because as we said, like these models, they just extract word patterns. And to some extent, word patterns correspond to facts, to correspond to some, some sort of word representations. But they, they are not actually extracting facts or knowledge from the text. They are just extracting text for textual patterns, right? And of course, you shouldn't use to take right high risk decisions or to write text that requires citation because when the and when you ask something to to the model, he the, the model will not try to to assess how correct or how factual is the answer. It will just create text that makes sense, that's kind of coherent. But it doesn't have anything to do with um, the, let's say, the ground truth. Uh, so please don't use for citations. And just very shortly, uh, what are your experience with good? What are some of the some good use case for AI models that were not covered here that maybe you would like to share with us? Have you used the, I don't know, ChatGPT or any other large language model for a specific purpose and you, and you got good results and you think it was useful? Maybe you can, that's great, turning qualitative data into quantitative data, product inspiration, like brainstorming, right, Julian? I guess we could could frame this way. Yeah, moonshot ideas. That's great. And what about the bad use case? Have you tried or maybe have you heard an experience of someone that used ChatGPT for something that he or she shouldn't actually use? Spelling strawberry blog post writing yeah with that there is an interesting I, I remember that maybe a week ago there was a meme uh viral content circulating 
showing how uh, ChatGPT and most language models failed to count the number of letters R in strawberry. And this is really funny because it's actually related. We are used to think that computers are good in, in counting, in math, and so on. But when it comes to ChatGPT and language models, they are not they were not created to to do math or to count items. So they will they can fail. It's completely. I mean, once you understand how these models work. It doesn't make sense to think in terms of hallucination because hallucination presupposes that the model should refer to a ground truth, right? But actually, no, the model shouldn't refer. If you understand how the model was trained and how it's like the inner workings, it, the model is just doing what the model is supposed to do. Who is actually hallucinating? It's us. We shouldn't expect the model to provide ground truth or to provide fact or research. Um, yeah. So let's, OK. You see, I'm failing in the task of, in, uh, like, be short in the conceptual part. But let's see if we can reach the, the tools in time. But I just wanted to show you this three which is basically the family of uh, transformer models since 12, 20, 2017, like when the, the paper was pu published. And we have basically, let's say two main, three main families. The one is the decoder only transformer models, which are, they, they are basically all the GIP, the, the GIP T family is here. So this decoder only branch, these models are good in generating text. This is the main goal here. And it's also related on, they, they are trained in slightly different ways. Like the overall idea is the one that we discussed, but there are some subtle difference between these models. Um, and this family here, basically the goal is to generate new text. Given a sequence of text, continue the sequence, either like providing an answer or maybe just completing the, the uh, draft of a text. And on the other hand, we have the encoder only family. Uh, and this branch here is good for natural language understanding tasks. So these models, they don't generate text but they are good in tasks like text classification and sentiment analysis, um, named entity recognition. So they are really good to kind of understanding the meaning of the text and accomplish with a particular task, right? Classify a text and so on. And they are usually small, smaller than the GPT models. But still, they are pretty good. They sometimes they are even better than GPT models, large uh, language models like G Chat GPT. They are actually better sometimes in tasks like text classification, as I said. And the encoder decoder family is basically, let's say, maybe the most preeminent use is text translation. You you have a text in one language, you only need to translate it to another language. And let's see hugging face very shortly. Um, so hugging face is kind of the open, the, the largest open source repository for models. So here, I don't know what's happening. Hmm. I can click. Well, okay. So let's see. Um, Hugging Face is an open source repository, and you can find here. Okay, here you go. You can find here a bunch of tasks, and so for instance, you have computer vision. You can work with image classification, image segmentation, uh, image generation. 
And you, you, you can see now that those concepts, for instance, zero shot image classification, because usually in, in, in for image classification models, you use it to you use it to train the model, like to provide some image, some examples, some labels, and you train the model to distinguish between, let's say, um, dogs and cats. And the model will just distinguish between these two categories. In zero shot image classification, you can use any label we want. The model will be able to, at least will try to distinguish any kind of category that we want to use. Uh, object detection, and then we have text classification, translation, and so on and so forth. So let's say you want to um, classify documents. So text classification, oops, text classification, but it's not in English. You want to classify documents in Polish, let's say. Then you can filter here the, the, the models. And what I usually do is sort by downloads to see kind of the most popular models. And then you have a multitude of options to explore. And as I said, that I will not have time to kind of cover how to, to use these models in practice, but it's really simple. It's just a few line of codes. And as I said, you probably will get good results uh, asking ChatGPT to assist you in like using some of these models to, to classify documents or to classify a text, to classify a collection of documents, for instance. Um, the only thing that you need to know is how to use a notebook, and I hope to show you in a few seconds. So let me go straight to the first exercise we are we will cover Whisper. Whisper is a model created by OpenAI, but unlike ChatGPT, it's actually an open source model. And it's basically for audio transcription. So you have, let's say you have a, you had a meeting and you need to tra transcribe the, the, the recording and you can use this tool. So here is the, notebook i show you how to use it i've downloaded here um an audio file to use and let's open the notebook so notebooks are basically a document that merges uh, codes text and um, the output of the codes and you can also include images and media but you see this cell, this cell here, and uh, it has a play button. It's this part is code, this part is text. And what we want to do is to run the code. Uh, and so you basically click this run button here. Actually, first we should check if we are using a GPU. So we are. So I go in runtime, change runtime. And if you have CPU selected, you might want to select some of the GPU options available uh, to save time. Basically, it's way faster to, to run AI models using GPUs. So you see now I have a check mark. It means that I successfully run this cell. It's basically installing the, the, the model. And what I want to do, I will set some parameters here. So model name, I have all these options, time, base, medium, large. I will, let's use time just to save time. Um, and link code, you can choose your language, the language of the, the audio file. So let's transcribe uh, this audio here. Uh, I have this M3 file and I will upload this file to my notebook. I can click on this file manager here, the icon, the folder icon at the left, and I will just drag and drop the file here. And 
it's important to remind that this Google Collab session will expire after I close the browser. So if you need to save some data, you need to download. And if you load something here, it will be deleted. And if you need to, to store permanently some, some file that you generated, you need to download from Google Collab. So I have my file here, audio.mp3. I will just set this as the file name, run the cell, and run the cell again. And now it's running. So now it's basically the, the model is working. You, you can also do it locally in your own notebook. Uh, it will require you though to, to configure Python environments and to install some packages. So basically here we are using Google Collab just to, to avoid all these kind of complications of setting up a local environment, but it's perfectly possible also because we don't have much time, it's perfectly possible to, to run it locally. So while this model runs, let's go to the next uh, task, which is audio, which is image classification. So now I have Whisper transcribing my, my audio here, and we see the results in a few minutes. But let's talk about image classification. And I wanted to share with you this um, tool that I've created as part of my fellowship with Bellingcat. You might have heard about them. It's basically a, a tool that helps you to sort images into folders. And that's the main purpose. Actually, what the tool does, it's, it's kind of a nice interface to use models from Hugging Face for zero shot image classification. So let me show you the guide first. Um, so what is, I, I, I will not, we will not have time to, to go into because this kind of model is not a transformer model. So it's slightly different from what we, we've seen. But if you want to check the tutorial, I can paste the link here in the chat. And you have a step-by-step -step tutorial on how to use this model for image classification. So let, let's say you, you have um, a folder, maybe your WhatsApp image folder. It has, I don't know, images from the gig group, like group photos with your friends, but you have some memes that you, you have received. And you have, I don't know, greetings cards from your uncle saying good morning, good afternoon. I don't know. I, I feel it's a very Brazilian thing. I, I don't know if you relate to this, this idea of receiving image cards with good morning, good afternoon from your uncle. But um, yeah, let's say you have a bunch of, you have a mass image folder and you want to, okay, that's great. So, and you want to, categorize these images. So you, you can create categories, for instance, uh, headshots or maybe selfies or maybe um, memes. And then you can use, uh, use these labels as input, use your image folder as input, and ask you the model to categorize in subfolders according to the most uh, suitable label for each image. So that's basically what this model does. And we have here the, um, some tips to, to write effective labels. Uh, you can check later. I will show you how the model, how this tool works soon. But we already have the result of our first uh, model, the audio transcribing model. You see that in the file manager, uh, it has created a folder with several different outputs. So you, you can have a, a subtitle with timestamps if you need to, to know exactly which, like the, the timestamp for each sentence in the, the text. Uh, but you can also download the, just the text with, as a text file. So let's see an example here. So this is, a text 
uh, a YouTube video about neural networks. Actually, I wanted to show you this. Because if you want to get a, a good technical and a very a solid technical understanding of what neural networks and transformer models are, I highly recommend this um, channel, YouTube channel. You have here this playlist and it's amazing. I, I love this guy. He creates like amazing animations showing how, how these kind of mathematical concepts are applied to AI models. And you see that the last three videos in this series is about the transformer network, then transformer neural network. So check it out if you want to, to kind of go deeper into the technical understanding of these models. Uh, but yes, we, we know now how to use um, an open source AI model to transcribe audio. Let's see how to use an open source AI model to classify images. So this one is even easier to, to run because you can just click here. It will load a, a kind of an interface. So instead of writing in the code cells, you can just use the interface to set the, the parameters you need to run the model. And I've created a folder in my Google Drive with some random images from my image collection. Um, yeah, it's, it's just some random examples of images. You have like, and the categories that we are going to use here to categorize these images are outdoor images and indoor images. I love this one. I feel it's a really motiv motivational message for all of us dealing with AI. Um, yeah. So let's see here. Okay. Now we have the interface. So you need to first click here, run the cell, wait for a while. It will install a lot of packages, it will run a bunch of code, and now you can interact with an interface. So the first thing is to mount your Google Drive, Drive folder. So basically, I I want I will grant access to this notebook for like to the, I will allow this notebook to read my Google Drive folders. When you run this notebook, you are not granting me, you are not granting Bellingcat access to nothing. It's just for you. It's just for this Google Collab session. Every time that you rerun this notebook, you need to grant access again. So now that I click here, you if I go to my file manager, I will see Drive here. So what I do is to find the image folder that I've created here, this one. I will find in the file manager, oops, Drive, my Drive, and the name is Geek Call. So, and I will copy path. So this is the source, right? This is the, the source of the images that I want to classify. And now I, I, I will set the destination where the classified images should be placed. So it will be in the same folder, but I will create a labeled um, subfolder. And here I can choose any of the hugging face models available for zero shot image classification. Uh, okay, I don't know why it's not working this time, but you can choose any of the hugging face models. There are, there are models for different purposes. There are models, for instance, focus on fashion items to classify fashion items. I don't know, clothes, I never use it, but there are models to geolocate images. So you could use images from different cities as uh, uh, the inputs and have the labels as the, the counter names or seat names. And the model would, will try to assign the images to the cities. And then you finally have the labels here. Let's say 
indoor pictures, outdoor pictures. One, just one short uh, tip to write effective labels. It's usually want to avoid single word categories. So instead of, um, let's say dog, you could write a picture of a dog because these models are trained, this type of um, image, zero shot image classification models, they are trained in pa with pairs with images and caption text. So in caption text, you usually don't have just a single word. You have like a sentence to describe the image. So that's we are we, why we try to replicate this kind of pattern when we set the the label. So let's keep the picture of dog. I don't think we have a dog here in my collection, but it will be a good text test. And let's see in dog picture, out dog picture. We are running out of time. Sorry, Eric but I will finalize my part soon. And finally, I can choose if I want to copy the original images to the destination folder, or if I just want to move, uh, or if I want to move straight the, 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 the images. Like if you have a very large collection, you probably don't want to duplicate the collection, right? So you don't, you maybe you not have enough free space on disk to duplicate the collection. So in that case, you could move, but let's copy and preserve the original file and let's grant access. And now the model, the, the code is downloaded in the model and it will do inference. It will check each of these image, each of these images and what, 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 what's happening like inside the model right now. It's first converting each of the images into an embedding representation. We already know what is what are embeddings representation, right? They are, the model is converting these images into numeric representations. The model then converts the each of the labels into numeric representations. And let's imagine we are living in this multidimensional semantic space that we we've seen and the model is trying to basically find what is the closest the nearest label to to each of the images so if the the numerical representation of my image here is closest to outdoor picture the model will assign this label to the to the image so i don't know what happened i guess it didn't work of course, it did not work because it's a live example. Um, maybe it's a slash missing here. Let me try again. Hmm. Well, it didn't work. I'm so sorry. I will not have time to debug uh, right now, but I. I, I I'm sure that something simple. Yes, exactly, demo effects. And you can try later. If it doesn't work with you as well, let me know and I will try to fix. Um, yeah, maybe while Eric is presenting the GPT for all, I can figure out what was the issue here. But yeah, the folder path, but it's correct oh it's incorrect yeah because it's in photos right it's my fault not thankfully it's not something with the code it's just me so now we see classifying 10 image so it's working out thank you julian um yeah i'm not smart enough to use my own tool um yeah but it run successfully now let's see yeah, I, I guess, yes, exactly, Philip, it doesn't work. Um, and now we have the labeled. We have an, a table with the results. So the image name, the, la the, the, the label that the model assigned to the image, and how confident the model is of this label. So you see that for some, 
it varies so like from 99 to 51. So it's definitely not perfect, but let's see. We, well, we don't have any dog folder here, which is good because my image collection didn't have any, any dog image. So the model, at least for this part, worked well. Well, these are indoor pictures. And yeah, this might be indoor or outdoor, depends on your, how do you define buildings. But yeah, it seems that the model did a uh, uh, relatively good work. Um, yes, please, Eric, uh, if you can show us. I guess we still have about like 10, 15 minutes. Uh, Fadi allowed us to, to, to yeah, to, to go a bit more on time. So yes, please feel free. And sorry for, I, I tried to squeeze everything, but I failed as I suspected. No. I, Adriana, I could listen to you talk about this stuff all day long. I was very fortunate to attend his session during gig days uh, in Berlin a couple months ago, which just sparked so many different ideas. And and while you're talking about this stuff right now, I mean, the usefulness of these tools offline, I mean, yes, it's, it's you're leveraging cloud infrastructure because of time limitations, but these things could absolutely be done completely offline with no internet access. Um, even you're talking about text classification. I'm sitting here with my Zotero library open and realizing that's the solution I've been needing all this time for updating, uh, automatically updating metadata and tags for these thousands of resources that I have here at my disposal. So thank you again. Uh, and, and same thing for speech to text. I mean, our ability to do, I mean, one of my goals is to have my own Alexa that operates without having to send all my data to Amazon servers. I want to be able to, you know, do that speech to text uh, recognition locally offline and be able to type, interact with my machine or say, hey, Spotify, play this song for me. And how, how can we kind of move in that direction? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm rambling. We, we are going over time, Fadi. We've got a couple more minutes. All right, I'm going to blast through this really quick. I, I guess I'll just show GPT for all, uh, which is a very, basic option. I'm not gonna be able to see. Can you see my screen here? Thumbs up and you can hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Yes. So I don't know how many of you did your homework. Kirsty, I know you did your homework. Um, you showed your your screenshot there asking what, what gig is, which is great. Uh, first, you've installed it. It runs on Linux, Windows, Mac. Find your model. So they give, present you with some different models. If you want to use uh, the API and use some uh, cloud models you can. Otherwise, you can search for models here. You install the model. You've already done that. Then we want to go and we, we want to start chatting. So we make a new chat. We select the model that we've downloaded. You have quite a few here at your disposal. And now we can we can ask uh, whatever we want. We're talking about coffee before. Please. I don't even have to spell it right. I always say please just in case Terminator Judgment Day happens. Please write a poem about coffee and it'll do something cheesy. This is a seven or eight gigabyte model. It's not very accurate, it's not creative, but it'll make make a poem about coffee. Um, now we can do some basic translation and actually maybe we do translate, I need a coffee into Arabic and we'll see how that works. And we're also tempting the demo gods today. I don't know, I'm gonna need an Arabic speaker to, uh, okay, I'm looking for a coffee. I could put that into a different translate thing and see whether that's actually accurate. It's, Is it pretty it's good? It's almost perfect. <laughs> okay, cool. Oh, that's that's a couple, a couple gigabytes. It's not searching online at all. Um, next, what we wanna do is just describe RAG. So Adriano did describe it incredibly well, retrieval augmented generation. So now we want to make a chat, uh, but we want to use, we wanted to use some local documents. So what I can do here, I can specify a folder and I can dump a bunch of PDFs into that folder. So I've dumped 46 PDFs on community networking and it's created those embeddings that Adriana was describing automatically. If I add another document into it right now, it's watching that folder, it'll automatically create those new embeddings. And now I can chat about those specific documents. So I'm going to 
I'm going to just copy and paste the question that I've already prepared here. How can remote community networks use solar infrastructure? I want to say use uh, these local documents for RAG, for that re retrieval augmented generation. It's going to be thinking a little bit right now, as he was describing, in that multidimensional space that's spinning around, uh, trying to find the embeddings and, and things that are most relevant within those 46 documents, sends that to the model, and then the model then presents it in a, in a human-readable form. Uh, notice how this is taking some time. My CPU consumption just jumped to 60%. It's uh, quote-unquote thinking, um, and it should spit something out in just a second. I'm not going to click uh, elsewhere because this particular software, uh, if I click something else, it'll actually unload the model, and it's going to be not what we want to do. But Okay, maybe it's because we're actually on the call that it's going slowly. Ultimately, what it's going to do is going to spit out an answer, and it's going to use. It's going to tell me which sources it drew from. So here's your here's your example. Here's your thing, and then these are the three documents that I can click and open. If I, I click it, and it'll open in a different screen, and then it'll offer follow up questions in general that we can uh, we can pursue. I found it interesting, Adriana, you mentioned before, I'm just going to unshare my screen if I can, that it's not going to give you, if, if I just type into most GPT, most chatbots, it's not going to give me references or citations. With this, using RAG, it kind of will, but it, not specifically. What would I think be really useful is that, to say, okay, here's your answer, but here specifically in that document is where I got that that information. Um, and I don't know if that's even a thing, but but I could I could see that as a very useful research tool. Um, the reason I just wanted to show this is that well I think we're all fairly familiar with ChatGPT and some of these other chat options, but ChatGPT is it's not open source, it's not local, it's not going to run offline. GPT for all does work offline. It is open source. Cobalt. Olama or Oyama, anything LLM, we can present you with uh, various options that are all lightweight, all open source, all that operate completely offline. And we can point you in the right direction for, for models that accomplish uh, different things. Um, the, uh, going back to the original purpose of sharing this is how do we ensure that the, the, the tools, the AI, and I even like to say AI, machine learning tools that Adriana was discussing, how do we make sure that these are available to people around the world without reliable and affordable access to the internet and electricity? And I think what's very powerful uh, is that with a couple gigabytes, three, four gigabytes, even I saw a model this morning, it's two gigs on a thumb drive, plug that into most computers and you can do what we just did translates, ask it questions. And it's not going to be 100% accurate with those smaller models, but it's it's certainly better than nothing. And it's in, in 10 years ago, we had to pack uh, hundreds of gigabytes of content on external hard drives or 100, you know, we would use these micro SD cards, 128 gigs, pack as much of Wikipedia on there as possible. And it, and it could still only do a fraction of what we can now with a couple, couple of gigabytes. So I think it's, it is a game changer um, from an educational perspective. Mandela said uh, education is the most powerful weapon with which we can change the world. If that's really the case, then this is a tool in our arsenal uh, that's incredibly powerful. Um, so I think in future discussions, when we actually have a full day workshop to kind of work through some of these things, uh, that would be an interesting conversation to pursue. Uh, and we are 10 minutes over time. Uh, I can talk about the benefits and barriers. We do need to be Careful, uh, careful about those barriers. You know the hallucinations, inaccurate responses. Um, what are you know? How do we respect intellectual property rights? And how do we make sure that this is all localized and uh, that they don't perpetuate biases and and uh, negative things? But again, fuel for future conversations. Uh, should we oh, do a Q and A? Do we have time for a little bit of dialogue? Maybe some questions for Adriano. Maybe five minutes if everyone. Is so okay yes, with this. we have time. I, I would love to hear you if you have something to discuss, to ask, to criticize. Uh, I have a question. <laughs> uh, maybe you indirectly answered this, um, but many of our partners don't have like the best laptops, computers, whatever. Is it still 
possible to use this local GPT on like quite bad hardware or is it does it have to be an M1 chip of Apple or I don't know um most 16 gigs of RAM is ideal. If you've got eight gigs of RAM, I, I'm sure you can run some small models. Adriano, maybe you can speak to this. A little bit of a uh, little bit of RAM, decent consumer CPU. You don't even need a GPU for for a GPT for all some of these models, some of these these programs. So it is accessible. What's getting exciting is is the notion of shared infrastructure. So if, if I have a network, say, say you're in your office, Bread for the World has an office, each one of your machines might not be very powerful, but if you've got one machine that with a GPU that's, that's highly capable or even a couple, and then you, through your phones or their PCs, they're just getting that, that user interface. They're able to use that software um, leveraging that that local hardware. Um, but to answer your question, yeah, I think it is possible using most consumer. And, and the latest Apple intelligence, some of the Apples will do it right on the phone itself. It's not going to have the best outcomes, but it is it is certainly possible. Cool. Thank you. I mean, just wanted to add that you, you asked it specifically about uh, GPT style models. But one, one thing that I would like to leave as like one of the final remarks that sometimes you don't need a large language model. Depends on, of course, if you want to have a general perfect assistant, something like ChatGPT, you do need uh, something like Oriyama and etc. But let's say you are interested in particularly in text classification, or you are interested particularly in summarizing text, or maybe a very specific application, or maybe transcribing audio from text to text. Then in that case, you can use some of the options in all in hugging phase, which are way smaller, uh, lightweight. They can run in like only CPUs. So I implemented a solution that when we, we, we had Twitter as one of the sort, like one of the active largest social networks in Brazil, I implemented a solution to that helped an uh, organization to classify tweets in real time. So to basically they, they monitor uh, firearm events in Brazil and they use it to either to keep track of new reports and so on. And we managed to implement the, the, the classifier using just CPUs, like a regular web server, no special feature, no GPUs, and it could run like nearly in real time. So the, the first question is, do you really need a large language model? Do you really need ChatGPT? Or maybe you can frame your something more specific and have a model just dedicated to this specific task. Uh, Bilal had a question, like if we can compare and contrast these three, it's it's three different versions of, of Gemma 2, which I use all the time. It's a, it's an amazing model, even that, that 10 gigabyte version. Um, one thing that I don't really understand is, is quantization and how smaller models can outperform larger models because of that compression or, or, or making those because of that process. So Gemma 2... Uh, I think I have a 20 gig version that outperforms the 70 gig version. Um, looking at these right now, I, I don't know, but I'm telling you that that's uh, Q8 F16 would be perfectly fine for most of your purposes. If you've got a machine that can handle the larger ones, then, then try it. It says likely too large for this machine, but try it anyway. Um, so it'll just go slower. You're not going to get as many tokens per second. It's not going to think as fast. But it should be able to run. And what I often there's do there's so many different, use, like yeah. there's like eight and then yeah. F32, F16 after the six. And it's like, okay, I thought there was quantization and that was basically the kind of compression for these things. But what's what's up with the Fs? And then some of them label things as models, some of them label things as not mo anyway. So it's uh I'm still trying to figure out. I mean, I, I know which one's like Reddit a is a good them. resource. There's a lot of different uh, communities and forums now that kind of will have uh, competitions and there are different rankings on a weekly basis, which aren't always accurate. We saw this reflection 7 dB model, which is supposed to be this new amazing thing. And it turns out it's basically just Claude 
and and this guy was hyping it up in order to make millions of dollars and uh it was complete it was a complete sham but everybody was very excited over the last week so it can be a good resource and i think over time we're starting to see uh people narrow in if you type in best gemma 2 model comma reddit on a search engine of your your choice and it should there'll be several conversations about exactly that all right great A way less technical, so I don't want to distract from the very interesting technical conversation in case anybody has a question that links up to this more directly than mine. Okay, well, maybe as a foreshadowing about the to the more philosophical conversations, but I was just wondering because like there were so many different use cases that were shared today. Um if if and how you're perceiving any conversation around like, let's say mindful use of different large language models in different cases. So I think uh, seeing how to phrase this in like a good way, but for some of the use cases shown, it's really clear that this is like the um, more efficient way of going about things and that there's not a really alternative for, yeah, for the sorting and, and, and things that were shown, like for other things, perhaps as translation, there might be other apps or tools out there. And if we're talking about having, like using these applications in different sort of energy, uh, um, deprived or other resource constraint environments, is there like a conversation about which yeah, sort of prioritization of certain kind of use cases or deprioritization of others because of um, resource and energy use and th that kind of conversation. Not that I know of. I would love to see where those conversations are happening. Okay, well, yeah, I think it would be really interesting to also kind of explore as a community so what, uh, what do we feel are the you know the kind of more de democratization of of the you of of the availability and of, of these um different tools and how do we want to kind of stand for a let's say mindful use both in terms of the privacy and more ethical AI concerns that were raised but perhaps also in view of like environmental topics so i think this is going to be really like cool stuff to also explore further i don't know fadia if you want to i don't want to take away the foreshadowing of the series but maybe if you want i can say a couple of words um, yes please go ahead so we re this has been so great and and i agree this would have been a great full day training as well so thanks so much for squeezing all this in but we really look forward also to continuing the discussion on these topics and uh, both on the side of like sort of practical trainings and what's out there and how we can use it and particularly like the open source alternatives to things as well as the kind of assessment of what does this all mean for us um and so we want to explore this in a series of conversations around um yeah ai use within our communities that like cassie's left already but she's also putting together some ideas for this um and yeah, I just hope to continue hosting these conversations in the next weeks. Our current intern, who's a really amazing Alyssa, did a kind of baseline research on different use cases of AI in the maker movement and like innovation hub scene. And there's a lot of really unfilled space. Um, so we hope to fill some of that. And, and I think it's great that we're sort of inching our way toward understanding, yeah, some of the complexities around this. So yeah, thank you. Well, this is the perfect handover to actually the next session, and I'm so happy to see how these sessions are flowing. So going on from this very hands-on, very informative session, we're going to go further to explore the use cases in the next week on the 18th, if I remember correctly, is our next session on AI. And we're going to be uh, exploring AI from the maker perspective and asking what is innovation? How do we, as a maker community, defin define innovation and what kind of innovation um, uh, do we find healthy, safe, and could be further utilized to help the community and grassroots communities around the world to thrive? So very much agree with your question, uh, Geraldine. I would love to explore how these large language models can actually be utilized instead of just 
judging it, but if you're able to have a good uh, understanding of how they function and um, what threats they bring with them, maybe uh, you could have a powerful way um, to work with them in the future and actually utilize them for uh, other communities because it is a resource and and it is kind of it's it's a it's a revolution in the world somehow you know having uh, GPT technologies accessible for for people all around the world you know uh, in Egypt in um, all around the global south also and, and exploring what that means right having access to these technologies um, this is a great conversation starter that I'm so happy to start uh, next week for those who would like uh, to attend also stay tuned for um, the announcement on our website and uh, yeah, I think any more questions? Should we uh, slowly say goodbye? Amazing. I know also Adriano has to run off. So I just would love to thank Adriano and Eric. It's so impressive and so amazing what you are working and the kind of perspective you're bringing in. Um, so very much happy that I'm learning more about your research, Adriano, and also seeing your work, uh, Eric, and um, yeah, just bringing in your perspective on what these tools can do in offline environments is also very, very interesting. So thank you again. And I wish you a lovely day night wherever you are and we'll see you again next week thanks everyone cheers for now thank you, everybody thank you, thank you.